I've been hosting since morning, and Mr. President has kindly consented me to give a break. So I'm handing over my the baton to Mr. PVG PVG Menon, who is ex IASA president, founder of Van Consulting, my long term colleague, 30 years in semiconductor field, um, apt person to introduce uh, Jesse and Professor Rao. You've just given me a lifetime award, 30 years. So guys, I have no intention of retiring right now. <laughs> you're, you're warned. <laughs> OK. Um, when um, you know, Professor Srinidhi called me, and I have to put a disclaimer, I got involved in ADCOM exactly five days ago. I must confess, I know a little bit about ADCOM. I've been on the, what was I, the organizing chair, or the deputy organizing chair in 2009-10. I've served on the executive council in the past. So I do know a little bit about ATCOM, but six years older. So five days ago, Srinidhi called me and said, listen, don't stay in Delhi. Come back to Bangalore. It's a nicer city. The weather is cooler. The traffic is worse. Uh, and now to earn your uh, right to attend ATCOM without uh, getting a, you know, paying the admission fee, you got to conceive of a new session. And so I said, listen, why don't we do a fireside chat? So he said, done. Now tell me what is a fireside chat. <laughs> so I should have realized that's how academic conferences work. Anyway, what we want to do in a fireside chat, and I uh, introduced this in ISA six years ago very successfully. The intent is we have clearly a thought leader. And in today, we are very lucky we have two thought leaders. We have an academic thought leader and a business thought leader. Um, we break away from this either chalk and talk or wave your hand format. Uh, full disclosure, I'm from sales, so we use PowerPoint and then wave our hands in front of it. And uh, the more a sales guy waves his hands, the more likely the product is only on PowerPoint. It doesn't exist in the fab. So um, what we do is we break the chalk and talk hand waving format, and we have a conversation. And my experience is that insights come from conversations, not from presentations. Presentations put people to sleep. Conversations get the creative juices flowing. Second, JC, I don't know how you're planning this, but you might want to have the audience also ask questions, in addition to what you are going to ask. And I'm sure you have a long list of questions anyway. Um, these are very, very uh, knowledgeable people here, very, very experienced people. I am not going to spend too much time uh, introducing Professor Ram Gopal Rao because you're going to hear uh, his citation read out in 45 minutes from now, and that citation will do a far better job than what a two-bit salesman can do. Uh, sorry, the last chip I sold was 32 bits. Okay. <laughs> um, JC, of course, good friend, chairman of IESA, very experienced, and has worked across three continents, JC? and uh, five countries, I think. Um, those of you who are planning entrepreneurship, one of the portfolios he handles, sorry, JC, you're going to get a lot of requests for visiting cards. He handles the M&A portfolio for Intel. Um, very, very experienced executive, has worked across multiple formats, uh, multiple uh, um, responsibilities in Intel, has helped set up multiple businesses. And uh, Professor Rao, um, 43 patents, um, has developed fundamental semiconductor technology, which uh, I may be excused for saying has given India bragging rights in the, in the field of semiconductor design and materials. Uh, technology that he has invented in his lab in IIT Bombay today is used on a significant portion of the Intel mobile chips that are so sold worldwide. And I dare say the significance of that is it gives us a seat on the high table for semiconductor design in the world and I think makes us proud as Indians. So without further ado, I'm going to request JC to take it away. And I promise you we're going to have a great 45 minutes ahead of us. Thanks. Uh, appreciate it. Um, so Professor, first of all, you know, welcome. And, uh, just to let people know, I'm, I'm meeting Professor for the first time today. Yes. And this has been a great privilege. I'm sure a lot of people in the audience, if you have not met him, 
you know, it, it is all our privilege to have you here and talk to you face to face. Of course, I know you. You don't know me, but you know I know you for many, many years because Intel has been, you know, working with you, and I keep hearing uh, in our reviews, you know, about the good work that you are doing, the collaborations we have, and so on. So it's a it's a great honor and a privilege. Um, now it's uh, it's a conversation. He said, I think it's it's just a Q and A. I think I'm going to ask uh, since I have the mic. Uh, and start, I'm uh, going to set the stage that we are going to ask as much as, you know, questions. And my goal is to gain, you know, as much as thought process that you have back with me that I can use. And then, you know, students and the faculty, uh, you know, can do the, do the same, right? Uh, so before we, you know, start, uh, let me tell you, uh, though I know the professor, I had not met him, but though I know, I thought I should get a resume, so I asked uh, Professor Srinidhi, can I get a, some profile so that I can, you know, a little bit be aware of all the work Professor has been doing. I got a profile, which is a 90-page document. <laughs> and... Uh, you can upgrade to the top. Yeah, oh, <laughs> okay, so I, I get that, and it's very technical. I'm not a technologist, uh, it's uh, very technical. Of course, I could, you know, read that. But very, very impressive, even if the person like me who started to, you know, go through it. Uh, so I'm not even going to attempt, you know, to, uh, to make an attempt to, you know, uh, introduce you for all your work. I think we will do it as, you know, part of you know, Q&A. So excuse me, if you were expecting me to do that, I, I would not be able to do a justice to that. Uh, now, a couple of things, though. Uh, you know, as I went through it, uh, uh, I know it from my colleagues at Intel, uh, Professor about Professor, um, I went through some YouTube videos, you know, I read that 90% 90-page document a little bit, whatever, you know, I could understand. So Professor, I'll try to, you know, analyze what I think, you know, your work, what you have done and how, uh, what you have contributed uh, here. So a couple of things, folks, very, very, you know, impactful. The three things come to my mind from that. Number one, he is a great collaborator with the industry and other academic institutions. The, all the work that you will see comes out of great collaborations that have been done. Maybe Samsung, Intel, you know, Infineon, IBM, acro and across the academic institutions. So I don't even treat him as an IIT Delhi professor. He is, you know, our national uh, you know, you can call him scientist, professor, you know, whatever. So that is number one, the collaboration piece of it. The second piece of it is very deep technique, technology solutions. And some people have called it, uh, you know, nanoscale devices and, you know, nanoscale, you know, technologies. I, I think it, the more he has focused is the platforms, developing the platforms on top of which you can create solutions for social good. So two things he connects with. One is the social good and how technology platforms can be adopted to you know, connect, connect to that. The third piece is all, all of the work that you will see from, from the professor, and you can contradict me if I'm you know, going in the wrong direction, is all the research that has been done, it is not to, do, to uh, publish papers. Publish papers is an outcome of it. I think the starting of the research from him, if you read everything that has been done, is first taking a problem and then starting a research on it, versus starting a research and publishing the papers. That was a big, big, uh, you know, aha I got from, you know, whatever, you know, I could see. So, you know, that is, you know, overall summary as I see it, and we will talk if I'm wrong, uh, if I'm right. I have not talked this to the professor, so he can, you know, totally bash me on, you know, these things, and which would be, you know, uh, totally fair, right? So before I go with the Q and A, uh, you know, first of all, congratulations for, you know, getting the award uh, from the ACCS Society, and I think we give, we should give him a standing ovation for that. Thank please, you. You know, before we start. And, and congratulations to the society for, you know, recognizing and, you know, doing a great job uh, for the selection, from the selection committee. Now, as we start, um, you know, I talked about the social good. I, I said, you know, the deep technology uh, work, the, the platforms, nano platforms that you have created. Uh, for the, you know, benefit of the audience, especially the students, uh, can you in, you know, your own way define that? 
the impact and uh, you know what the work uh, that you have you know taken uh, how it started and where th that work is going for me i think your summary was uh, pretty pretty much right uh, that's these are the three, three things that characterize whatever i have done but i think one of the things i very consciously did from the beginning was not to take a problem which i can solve only with my my understanding of something i know i have always uh, looked at uh, problems as problems and then if i did not know some part of the problem i have always brought in somebody who can help me with that so i have taken up problems which are beyond my own realm of expertise and uh, so that i have consciously done so a little bit of risk taking i think that had always been there with me otherwise i wouldn't have left a very secure and comfortable job in bombay and took up a director position in delhi you know in the middle of where all the politics happened so so i think i have always been a little bit of risk taking kind of a person and uh, but i am a good collaborator i have collaborated with a large set of people and uh, i have never had any problems with people uh, that way so i think uh, giving credit to where it is due uh, to the others and having a good team of students motivating them getting the best out of them i think yesterday was the teachers day and the flood of emails and messages that i have received i think you know i, I can see that uh, i think i have touched some lives at least in some way which makes me feel very satisfied and uh, but i think i have also noticed that the students who were very good when they came to me and they got a degree and went away they don't really you know are, they are not very grateful because they were already very good and what i have could add probably was a good something in their resume and they could find a job but the but the students who were when they joined me did not know what they were what they were worth and they came and they, there was a self realization on their part about their capabilities and i could see a transformation in their lives in their confidence levels you know from the time they joined and by the time they graduated i think these are the guys who are most grateful and uh, i think that is also the most satisfying part for me as a teacher because those who were good i could only add probably incrementally to them but those who did not know how good they were for them to realize their potential and do well in their life i think those are the students i feel you know very proud about and uh, i'm happy that as a teacher i could do that and uh, i think that is probably the most satisfying part for any teacher and uh, i think i have that pride in myself and otherwise i am very humble and i know what i have done i have not done but when it comes to students i am very happy that i touched at least some lives and i think teaching jobs are the best jobs in the world so i think i can tell you all the all the students about that. <laughs> okay going a little bit into your work uh, specifically um, so you know i talked about whatever i understand uh, you know developing a nano platform and what intrigued me in into that was you know the technology he was developing is used for you know a medical device that can you know take uh, uh, that can help with the cardiovascular diseases or detect cardiovascular diseases but also the same technology can be used for uh, detecting explosions uh, you know bombs or you know um, you know those kind of things so can you in a little bit talk to the students and the faculty on how that you know thought process came in and what that technology is uh, and if people have to look at how they uh, you know develop these kind of platforms you know how the thought process should work no, that's a that's a good question in fact when i after i came back from us and joined iit bombay so i continued on my phd my postdoc problems and phd problem for some more time and uh, from 98 when i joined iit bombay till about 2004 2005 i was continuing on similar kind of works and i was publishing papers and all that around 2003 2004 time frame my work started to get recognized in the country and abroad and i started to get some recognitions the first one was the swarna jayanti fellowship which is given for researchers below the age of 40 years and so i my work got noticed in the country and that is when i started asking myself you know can i do something more than just taking up a problem and publishing papers and uh, so that is when the the so we said can we i mean if, if we, i also told myself that if this was what i wanted to do if my goal was to work with intel and write papers and do that i could have done that better by being in us 
there was no need for me to come back here and work with Portland Group in Intel and then write papers. So after some time, I, I started to think that, you know, since I have come back to India, now I should do something, you know, which can be of interest to the society around. So that was a kind of a realization in about 2004 time frame. And then I consciously started to look for problems, you know, outside of my discipline and the real social problems. And uh, so one of the problems, one of the things I, I started doing was even interact with the medical doctors through my colleagues in the biomedical department. So I started to develop collaborations with biomedical people and all that. And until that time I was collaborating, but I come from a device background. I was collaborating with people who work in the circuits kind of thing, our systems. So we did a lot of work on technology aware design, device circuit interactions, so which were all good and all that. But those people were still in double E department. But then I started to work with biomedical in material science, in chemistry. So then uh, you know, one of the things we wanted to do was talk to people who are outside of our discipline. I still strongly believe that creativity, innovation happens when unlike minds work together. So in fact, in my presentation, I will also show a slide on that. I call it unlike, you know, where, for example, people who, who have come from a different disciplinary training. So that, so that is unlike mine. Or people from an industry, because from industry, you come with a completely different attitude towards a problem. The way I look at the same problem, the way an industry person looks at are very different. So working with people who have different attitudes is what I call unlike minds or people with different cultures. You know, instead of me interacting with another person with a similar kind of educational background, if somebody, you know, has come from, a, a, from US or, or a foreigner, when I talk to them, I think, you know, because of their cultural background, they also tend to think, look at problems differently, work differently. So to me, this bringing this unlike kind of minds together is very, very important for us to become creative whether it's attitudes or disciplinary training or cultures. So I have tried to, I am, in fact, in my current position, this is one thing I am doing. In all these three aspects now, at IIT Delhi, if you look by the numbers, in the three years, we would have improved things by at least an order of magnitude. So that, so that is what I, uh, I, am, uh, I am looking at. And so in my case, for example, we started to talk to doctors, the medical doctors. So we asked them a very point blank question. So what do you think we should do as engineers for you? In your day-to-day -day kind of a practice, is there something that we can develop which can make a difference to your, your career? So that was a very point-blank question we asked to people from different disciplines. So we looked at multiple problems and many things and finally we latched on to that cardiac kind of a problem. So we said, uh, can we develop a 100 rupee test if somebody has a chest pain? In 100 rupees, can I rule out whether the chest pain is because of a cardiac problem or because of anything else? Because today, you know, that is a big concern. If somebody has chest pain, a little bit of perspiration, then you go to, we don't go to an MBBS clinic, you go to a big, you know, cardiac kind of a hospital and they monitor the, all the parameters and all of that, you know, so that is a current process. Now we said, can we rule out the cardiac problems in 100 rupee, kind, using a 100 rupee test? So once we define the problem, once we fix the price point, we said this has to be 100 rupees. If it is 1,000 rupees, then the kind of people who will use it, the kind of hospitals where it will go will become very limited. But if it is 100 rupees, if the test is done in a very simple kind of a fashion, then every MBBS clinic will have that. And then if I have a chest pain on way to office, I will just walk into an MBBS clinic, get this test done quickly. And if things are normal, then I proceed with my work. And if things are not normal, then I go to a bigger hospital and stay back and all of that. So that was what we had in mind as a technology. So, so once we defined the problem, once we defined where it is going to be used, once we defined what should be the price point, you know, then uh, the problem became very interesting. Then, you know, what kind of materials would you use? What kind of te technologies would you develop? What kind of equipment you will use? It, to make that platform, if I am using an equipment which costs, let's say, 10 crore rupees, it's not going to be 100 rupee kind of a test. So the, because the whole facility might become pretty expensive to set up and all of that. So once we fixed all of these uh, points, then, then the problem became actually more interesting. And one of the you know, issues that every faculty member points out is, you know, if I start developing products, you know, can I write papers? And if I cannot write papers, what will happen to my promotion? And then if I bring some box to a, a selection committee, you know, would you promote me kind of a thing? 
So these are concerns that faculty members would have. So the, the, my point was, you know, if you choose a problem, the problem was defined, and then because we fixed a boundary for all of that, the problem actually became more interesting, more challenging, and 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 then we started to look at new materials because I had to make the device, uh, sell the device in hundred rupees. Therefore, I need to my manufacturing cost need to be thirty rupees. Now, if the manufacturing cost needs to be 20, 30 rupees, then what kind of materials would I use? Can I make the device? Would I make it by using silicon or would I use a polymer? You know, from that point onwards, the entire, you know, the, the, the set of uh, the, the problem definition changes. And then the problem became pretty interesting. And we were able to write lots of papers because we were the first people in the world using a new material for that particular application. And that became necessary for us because of the parameters that we set, constraints that we set for ourselves. And then we were able to write lots of papers and everything we, we uh, did became a patent because nobody had done that before. And then finally, but it was all f focused on building a platform for this application. So, the, so on the platform, we could write lots of papers, file many patents and, and once the platform became very good, then we were able to use it for different applications and that's how the whole work act, uh, work happened. But you know, in the process, there was no problem in writing papers. We were able to write better papers than we could have done without a problem defined the way we defined. I think that is something for academic institutions to do because that, that multidisciplinary culture that exists, or at least these departments are all there in a large institute. Now, how do we bring them together? So we have always been talking about multidisciplinary research, but how would I motivate a chemistry person to work with me? I think there is no reason for us to work with each other because I think you know everybody is doing their own things and and but if you put the problem first and if that person also gets excited about the problem and its impact, you no know, many people would like to join hands. Yeah. The first project we wrote at IIT Bombay involved about uh, six different departments and but we were very clear that this is the product that we put out into the market kind of way. And then you know people were very happy to collaborate and and it became very interesting and the students who worked on that project also got excited and uh, I think it was a good learning experience. So once we did that, uh, it took us, for us to develop the full prototype and get it tested in a hospital, took us about 10 years from the proof of concept to the final product. And uh, the second one, we took the explosive detector, took us about seven to eight years because we learned a few things from the first experience. The third product now on which I have another startup is an agricultural sensor that we could do in about four years time frame. So now we started becoming better because now we knew you know, how to design a product, how to what goes into that, how to ensure the reliability and you know, I think, so that was a learning experience. And since we started this activity in 2004, now I am enough confident. If you give me three PhD students, I can start a company out of them after their PhD. And uh, so now I have developed that confidence in how to choose the problem, how to choose the correct problems and doing that uh, socio-economic kind of studies, the commercial kind of studies, because if you, if your goal is to start a company, I think, you know, you have to from the beginning think on those lines. It wouldn't happen out of the blue that I am doing something and suddenly a company came out of it. I think, you know, it has to be very focused. You have to look at the techno-commercial aspects of everything from the beginning. And, uh, you know, now I can, with every three, four PhD students, I can start a company and make it successful. But, but I think, you know, but it has been a, almost a 20 year journey now. And, uh, but now I have become more confident and I think, uh, but that is what in my opinion needs to happen in our academic institutions. At IIT Delhi, we are pushing this entrepreneurship in a very aggressive way. And I want to see every fifth faculty member at IIT Delhi to have their own startups. And just yesterday we launched a program for faculty members, I called it FIRE, F-I-R-E, standing for Faculty Innovation Driven Re faculty innovation and research driven entrepreneurship, FIRE. And under that, we are giving funds to faculty members and we are giving them space, we are giving them whatever leave. In fact, a faculty member at IIT Delhi can take three years of leave, of which the first year is a fully paid leave, and to work on a problem and start a company. So the, I think I, once faculty members start doing it, our students will do that. And once our students start doing, then we will start to churn out more people who can become job providers rather than just looking for jobs. And once these students from these institutions start to provide jobs, you know, I think the, the country's economy and we will create wealth and the whole country can prosper. I think it all has, needs to start with academic institutions. To me, the job creation, you know, India requires a million jobs per month today. 
and who is going to create that government can only make policies and the big companies like Samsung, I think they are already saturated, they are doing what they need to be doing. I think our future lies in our academic institutions and these institutions need to churn out graduates who can go out and who develop the confidence to provide jobs for others rather than everybody just looking for jobs. I think for that the choice of problems needs to be done very carefully and that is where the faculty members, you know, their uh, capabilities become very critical and, uh, and therefore it all needs to start with the faculty here in this country. So, Professor, this is, you know, very, very intriguing because uh, we always talk about, you know, creating, uh, you know, job creators, not job seekers, you know, I think that is what uh, you are mentioning. And one of the things, you know, as you talk about multidisciplinary collaboration within the academia, I think we need it within the corporates too. You know, we have so many product groups and silos within our uh, organizations that at times we forget that we can be more effective in collaborating. And if I have to take it further, I think from industry to industry, you know, being in Bangalore, we don't collaborate from company to company that much. Uh, I think we need to, you know, I think learn from this model and, uh, you know, see what we can do uh, here. Uh, now, shifting a gear a little bit, um, can you speak about a uh, little bit about the nano sniff and what was the need to, you know, create nano sniff and uh, what is the purpose it is solving right now? Uh, just for the audience, this is the company that Professor created as part of IIT Bombay. Uh, uh, they have a system of this uh, company creation and it is doing some great work, but I'll, I'll let the Professor speak about why that was created and what is it good doing right now. So it was a very interesting journey. So once we created the prototype for the cardiac diagnostic system, then we did not know uh, the industry, unfortunately in India, in the medical, ec the, the, the equipment kind of space, there aren't many and they were not, it was difficult to work with them and all that. So we said we will start our own company, but that time we did not know what is starting a company and all that. And, uh, but then we were already covered in the newspapers quite prominently, wherever I, in fact, I remember I went to Indian Science Congress and I talked about our explosive detector technology. And uh, just to explain, because Indian Science Congress attracts children, many children, I said, think of it as an electronic dog, an electronic dog which can, which can sni sniff explosives. So then the next day in the newspapers, IIT Bombay developing e-dog kind of a thing. So everywhere they were calling it e-dog, e-dog. And that e-dog word picked up and everybody started talking of e-dogs. Yeah. And then there was a tech fest at IIT Bombay. And some of my students said, sir, since everybody is calling it a dog, you know, that time, until that time it was a small aluminum box kind of a thing. Since everybody is calling it a dog, let us make it look like a dog. And then we bought a, a small puppy toy, a remote control toy. And we inti took out all the sensors and everything, integrated them around the dog, the puppy kind of a toy. And the nose, we put a smell sensor and electronics inside the body and all that. So we actually demonstrated a product where you put some source there, it can be taken there, smells, and it barks. So that, so that became a big hit in that uh, tech fest kind of a thing. Yeah. So, that, so that created a lot of excitement. It was all in the newspapers. And somebody from uh, Delhi, you know, contacted us who was in the space of under vehicle scanners, critical, critical technologies. Mm -hmm. So they contacted us after reading this saying that we are already in the security space and we currently detect the under vehicle uh, things using scanners. So we are interested in what you are doing and so they came forward and uh, it looked interesting. So the, we did not know what starting a company and all that was and we, you know, people came and we did not know what equity and we were all just academic kind of people and so that time we said uh, there were four people involved and we did not even want to negotiate equity. We said, let us start with 25% equity for each of us kind of a thing. And uh, so we did not know what was sweat equity, what was debt equity. So yes. Now I am much wiser, but uh, at that time, you know, it was okay to start something. And we started it and then uh, it was a struggle, but you know, it worked very well in the laboratory. I could demonstrate it to anybody in a room like this, a closed room. But once we took it out, then it became very different. So it did not really work once we took it outside, particularly in Bombay with the kind of monsoons and the humidity there. And the sensors started to behave very weird. And uh, so, but by the time we already started the company, and uh, so it was a challenge. They, it took them almost six years from a, to make a laboratory prototype to work outside. And they had to change lots of things. And, but for a technology company to survive for six years 
was a challenge. And then, but we had a platform which we developed in the academic institutes. We knew that that will work in any other academic institute. So we started selling that platform. So NanoSniff developed a product, Omnicant, which was basically what we developed as a platform. And that platform, they started selling to academic institutes. And many academic institutes, you know, bought that and started developing uh, laboratory experiments around that. So they were able to earn some revenues and put that money back into the company and survived for six years. And finally, they were able to launch the product now, the explosive detector. Yeah. And that is how the nano sniff uh, came into existence. And they moved out of the incubator, they moved to the tech park. But you know, because this is a very high tech kind of a solution, it's a complete disruptive technology. There is no explosive detector based on the on the platform that we have developed it. And it was a dis disruptive technology compared to anything that exists in the world. So we now have, think we have a big market. So now they have moved to the tech park and then so they have launched the product and now we are looking at selling it to people and all that. So that is how the nano sniff happened. But the, around the same platform, uh, I got excited with these agricultural sensors. In yeah. fact, uh, uh, once the principal scientific advisor office, you know, they arranged a meeting. They got some professors from IITs like us who are working in sensors and platforms kind of a thing with the agricultural scientists. And for the first time in this country, engineers, electrical engineers like me got a chance to speak with the agricultural scientists. The biggest challenge that exists in this country is our higher education system is completely fragmented. There is no, you know, a complete comprehensive kind of a university in India. The medical, you go to AIMS, management, you go to IAMs, science, you go to ISIS or IASC, engineering, you come to IITs. I think that is how we have fragmented and nobody is talking to anybody. And the, the medical research comes under ICMR, the agricultural research comes under ICAR. And so we have the funding agencies are different, the institutions are different, and nobody ever talked to anybody. That is one big issue now. So for the first time, Dr. Chidambaram, principal scientific advisor, not the economic <laughs> minister Chidambaram, <laughs> the, this is R. Chidambaram. <laughs> so, the, so what he it did... It's become important <laughs> to clarify. That. I know, <laughs> otherwise... <laughs> after that e-dog experience, I am more careful now. <laughs> So, the, so what Dr. R. Chidambaram, uh, he arranged a meeting in Delhi in Vigyan Bhavan with uh, the agricultural scientists and all of us. He put us in a room, he said, for a day you talk to each other, whatever you want to. So we again asked them, you know, what do you want we should do for you kind of thing. And they gave us a presentation on what sort of technologies they require. One of the very simple things they said was the, the saving water used in the agriculture. Yeah. And in a, they said in a state like Maharashtra, for example, 85% of water goes to agriculture, only 15% goes for human consumption. So now out of 85% of water, the agricultural scientists believe that 50% of that water is wasted because farmers don't pay electricity and they think the water is an infinite resource and they over irrigate their, their fields and uh, which doesn't help the crop and it only consumes the natural resource. And they said, you know, can we develop a simple technology where the farmer will know you know, how much of water to put for a crop. It looked like a very simple problem. Basically, you are measuring soil moisture. And so I thought as an electrical engineer, what is there to measure a soil moisture? You put two electrodes, measure the conductivity, you know, you can, you can be in the game kind of thing. Yes. So we actually uh, said, you know, this is a very simple problem. In six months, we will give you a soil moisture sensor. Then they said, you know, no, don't underestimate the problem. You come to IARI, the Indian Agricultural Research Institute. They have all these technologies. You look at how they do the soil moisture. When we, we had a one day visit to IARI and they showed us that agricultural, the soil moisture sensors they were using, each one of them was costing about two to three lakhs kind of a thing. So each soil moisture sensor were two lakhs to three lakh rupees. And that in IARI you can buy and install, but what about a small farmer? I think it's not going to happen. And we realized that it's pretty complex. I mean, measuring soil moisture is not as easy as measuring conductivity of soil and all that because the soil type varies and uh, you flood the, do flood irrigation and there will be a short circuit and so it became a very interesting problem. And uh, so then we, I took PhD students and we developed a group and developed soil moisture sensors. So now after about a couple of years, we have uh, two types of soil moisture sensors, one which are very inexpensive you can get them in 500 rupees and set them up. And one which is about 15,000 rupees to calibrate them. The calibration is, is pretty important there. And uh, there are, you can buy soil moisture sensors from many websites, but after a month, you cannot use them. 
So somebody needs to calibrate it with a standard instrument. And uh, I started interacting with our civil engineers. I asked them, how do you measure soil moisture? You know, they said, we take soil, we uh, measure the weight of the soil, we heat it, heat for 24 hours, remove the moisture, we again weigh it, and from the difference in weight, we calculate the soil moisture. So I said, in 21st century, you know, if this is the way you are measuring soil moisture, and that is a that is a standard technique right now. That is the gold standard for measuring soil moisture. I said, we can actually do better than that. We can miniaturize, we can develop technology. So we worked on a calibration system, a time domain refractometry based system with microwave uh, absorption and all that. So we developed a TDR based system. We developed the capacitive sensors. So we, you know, then we started a company, the PhD students who graduated started a company now. Uh, so that is selling very well. And uh, so that company is getting established now pretty well. And then, uh, but the soil government of India has given soil health cards now to farmers. And there are at least 20 parameters there, which are measuring the micro and macronutrients in the soil, like the, the nitrates, phosphate, potassium, and all of that. And where will the farmers go on to go to get them actually measured? So they have to give the soil to agricultural labs and all that is a pretty complicated process. So we said, can we develop sensors for monitoring, you know, some of these soil health card parameters, which government has already distributed. So we started a group now between Delhi and Bombay IITs to work on different types of prototypes and it became a very